right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the the Rangel Social Center for Social Medicine slash uh, research team in health equity and translational social science seminar series. We're very excited to invite to. just last night from Virginia mm. <laughs> um, and who is a medical anthropologist and associate professor of anthropology at the University of Virginia. She's also serving as a associate dean for graduate affairs and is currently leading collaborative ethnographic research projects on substance use recovery in religion and religion in Uganda in the United States. I met China several years ago because her reputation preceded her as um, a foremost medical anthropologist of substance use and addictions in Uganda. And um, we have had a lot of flourishing collaborations since. I'm just really thrilled to have her here in person. And then I especially want to warmly welcome Sarah Namarembe, who is a researcher based in Kampala, Uganda. So she is coming from either even further away than Virginia. She is a founding member of Focus on Recovery Uganda, and she's getting her master's degree in medical anthropology at Gulu University in Northern Uganda. I have had the distinct pleasure of working with Sarah to co-organize co an international network with many people around the table here um, called the Substance Use and COVID Data Collaborative. Uh, Sarah has done an outstanding job as organizer of that network, which now covers 15 different countries and has produced a bunch of publications, a special issue of American Journal of Public Health, a bunch of grant proposals and progress, media projects. So it's very exciting to have Sarah here in person for the first time since we've all been working virtually since COVID together. Um, with no further ado, I hand it over to First, I believe it's going to be China, Actually, and then uh, Sarah. Turn off the video. All right, um, welcome anyone, everyone. We're thrilled to be here. and We're gonna be co-delivering this talk, so there'll be a bit of back and forth. Um, and thank you so much, Helena, for inviting us here today and um, for all the warm collaborations over the years. So. Um, Sarah's going to begin. Hey. Um, so I'll start with Kajumba. Um, in August 2015, our collaborator George Mpanga went to meet a man named Kajumba at his home, just off Entebbe Road Highway. Pastor Andrew had recommended. Pastor Thank Andrew you. had recommended that we meet him so that we might learn something about the people who had stopped drinking through their involvement in food chat. You can't miss their house, it's the old one from the 1960s. First Andrew had instructed him. George had in fact seen that old house many times as he passed on this road, not knowing that it was Kajumba's. The house was a big one and it was surrounded by a very large compound and shaded by palm and mature trees. The girl collecting water at the family, <laughs> at the family water tank directed George to Kajumba's house at the back of the compound. George had briefly met Kajumba only once uh, before, and at first he did not recognize his face. But when Kajumba stood up, his unusual height made him unmistakable. He was holding a hole in his hand and a tin of bean seed at his feet, clearly wanting to get back to his planting. He asked George how long the interview would take. I can only give you 10 minutes today. I want those seeds to spend the night in this soil, he said, ushering George into the house. After the formalities of greetings and consent forms, Kajumba began to tell his story. I'm 53 years old. I come from the line of Sekaba Katembo, he started. My father was Catholic and wanted me to become a priest, but he took me out of the cemetery, the seminary because of my poor grades. After attending a different secondary school, I came back to the family home and got a job nearby at a garment factory. I was earning well, but then Ida Amin was overthrown, the company was looted, and I lost my job. After that, I started slowly to test Waraji, and it gradually developed into a habit. I had gotten a new job, so I was working, but I was also seriously drinking alcohol, feeling like a youth. 
I took five years, seven years, 10 years drinking in a respectable way. But when I clocked 12 years, alcohol said you are now ours. And I began doubling the amount that I took. To get money to drink, I started selling things from the house. I was unmarried and living in the boys' quarters. Eventually, I sold all my clothes. I used to pray for sunshine so that I could wash and quickly dry the only shirt and trousers I had left. Then I saw the bed, the cups, even my fellow drinkers just me away from their group because I stopped bathing and washing my clothes. Eventually, my father locked the house because there wasn't anything left in it, and I forced to sleep on a stack of bricks that I didn't have the firewood to burn. But truly, how could they let me sleep in the house? How could I fit in a family of the royal clan, me who looked like a mad person? My father refused to let me enter the house to eat, but even though my father refused, my mother would sneak food to me when, he, when she could. Now I know you say that you don't have much time today. Let's talk about how you quit, George interjected, worried for Kajumba's beans and the fading sun. It was June 1999, Kajumba continued. There was a concert at the playing field and people singing. As they sang, my heart started to pound in my face. Two women from the church came over to me and said, come to the gospel and Jesus will free you from alcohol. I answered, give me one week and I'll get saved. This wasn't the first time I'd thought about this. My young brother was saved and he was always telling me to get saved. And this was the time when my friends were seeing me as a nuisance and didn't want me near them. I didn't have any money left and I had sold everything that I had. I began, I had begun to realize that my drinking was a serious problem. And I had even told my young brother that I was going to jump into in front of a car and kill myself. I had also started having strange dreams that left me weakened when I woke up. The next morning, I went to see the woman at the bar for my morning bottle, as I always did. That morning, I drank and even brought some home. I don't remember what I had sold then to buy that bottle. I went to my stack of bricks, drank and slept. When I drank on that particular day, I woke up at 3.45 p.m. and saw the Lord. I can't say it was a dream, but I saw him. I woke abruptly and I was sweating heavily. In the vision, the Lord was wearing clothes like a caterer. Like a chef, George asked, thinking he had missed Miss Hart. Exactly. He was up on the wooden stairs and I tried hard to reach him, but couldn't. He said to me, child, you have refused to leave alcohol, but I'm here mending my shoes. For 16 years, I had failed to interpret, I have failed to interpret this vision. It could be that I didn't hear well, but that's what he told me. I woke up again a few minutes later, sweating heavily, and my heart was telling me, go and get saved, otherwise you will die of alcohol. I stood up. As I reached the water tank over there, my young brother, who had got saved before, came. I told him, I'm going to get saved. The Lord asked me to get saved. He doubted that I was serious, but he said, I'll go with you. He went and got his bicycle and drove me until we reached Christian Glory Center. At that time, the road to, to the church was still narrow and bushy, but Pastor Christophe, Charles, and Andrew were there. Pastor Christophe saw me from 30, minutes, 30 meters away and shouted to me, you man, you are really blessed by God. Before I even knew you, George asked. Kajumba stopped talking and started to cry. George stopped talking too, and both men sat in the sitting room in silence for a few minutes as Kajumba's tears streamed down his face. For some time, Kajumba composed himself and continued. Pastor told me you were about to die in just a matter of hours. And it was the truth because I really was about to throw myself into the moving cars speeding down on the road. The pastor then asked, why have you come here? I said, pastor, I have come to get saved. He told pastor Charles, go and pray for that man. Pastor Charles took me to the church, which was small at the time. Inside the church, we also found a, nice, a niece of mine, another girl who was always asking me to get saved. When she saw me, her face lit up with joy and said, uncle, as uncle has come to get saved, Pastor Patrick began to pray for me, and that's when I lost consciousness. When I woke up, my niece was still there waiting for me. This was a Friday. Pastor Andrew was the first person who gave me clothes to put on the following Sunday. He also gave me a Bible. I, the person who never bathed, never shaved, realized that time how filthy I was. Something big dispossessed me, and that I found out how dirty I was. At home, I told my mother how I got served. But she replied in a mocking voice, God saved? 
Glory be to God, she thought it was a joke. When I went to church on Sunday, the service bored me at first. After the service, I went to Pastor Patrick and he asked who I was. I told him I'm the man Kajumba who he prayed for. He was amazed. He had thought I wouldn't stick to it, but indeed God had changed me instantly. Higher powers. This story is a testimony. While Kajumba rarely shares it publicly, it's a narrative that it is intended to convince those who hear it that God can heal people and act in their lives. It's also intended to give praise, glory, and thanksgiving to a God to whom Kajumba himself remains deeply and sincerely devoted. As such, this story would find an easy place at a Christian revival or in one of the many slim, glossy, covered devotional tracts that one finds for sale on street corners and bookshops in Kampala. But what are we to do with such a story here at the start of an academic talk at the Center for Social Medicine? Well, Kajumba's story is indeed extraordinary. It's not at all unusual to hear these stories in Uganda. This is true both in terms of the severity of the difficulties that Kajumba faced because of his drinking and in the way he eventually escaped from those challenges. Problems that addiction researchers would term alcohol use disorders are common, common in Uganda. A recent study estimates that nearly 10% of adults in Uganda have an alcohol use disorder, and the per capita consumption rate among drinkers is among the highest in the world. However, as Kajumba's story reveals, biomedical models of these problems and the pathways that might lead towards their resolution are not the only or even the dominant framework for understanding and addressing these issues there. I should already be clear, Kajumba's understanding of his transformation differs in significant ways from the prevailing biomedical models of substance use disorders. Since the 1990s, clinicians, policymakers, and members of the public in many countries have increasingly been taught to think of substance use disorder as a chronic relapsing brain disease of the CRBD model. Under the CRBD model, addiction is understood to be a problem of individual biology that results from the permanent effects of drugs and alcohol on a person's neurobiology. This model both diverges from, diverges from earlier stigmatizing models focused on the weakness of will and also replaces earlier clinical attempts to cure addiction through the use of various physical and chemical techniques. Importantly for our talk today, the CRBD model also casts addiction as a problem that can be managed but never cured. And so while the idea of addiction as a disease rooted in biology might free a person from the stigma of earlier moralizing models focused on the will, the focus on chronicity certifies that one is consigned to something of a life of inescapable repetition, and this too may be a heavy burden to bear. In our forthcoming book, Higher Powers, Alcohol and After in Uganda's Capital City, we explore the affordances of other ways of viewing and experiencing addiction and recovery that diverge from the CRBD model for Ugandans attempting to leave alcohol use behind. In addition to inpatient rehabilitation centers, which deploy this model, we write about herbal aversion therapies, which make use of locally produced plant-based emetics. We explore forms of spirit mediumship practiced by Basamize, who seek to solve problems in their lives by coming into tighter relations of reciprocity with the Balu Bale spirits. And we study the practices of Pentecostals like Kujumba, who attribute their recovery to deliverance and the action of God in their lives. While the idioms of aversion, possession, and deliverance deployed in these alternative frameworks are at times severe, we argue that they contain within them concepts and practices that point away from the model of addiction as a chronic relapse in brain disease and towards some possibility of release. Uh, we looked at the methods. So this work draws on four years of collaborative ethnographic field work, given our interest in the ways processes of personal transformation play out over time, most of our efforts were focused on following 21 people who had or were trying to start. Sorry. Um, this work draws on four years of collaborative ethnography of work. Given our interest in the ways processes of personal transformation play out over time, most of our efforts were focused on following 21 people who had or were trying to stop you drinking using one or more of these four therapeutic pathways. Our methods viewed as they were around following people home, as opposed to interacting with people only as they were passing through therapeutic sites for treatment, were explicitly 
designed to move away from rethinking about medical anthropological field sites as defined by institutions. While the role of relationships in addiction recovery is central to the content of this work, at a more methodological level, this talk is also an outcome of a relational composition. George and China's collaboration began in 2007 when China was just starting her dissertation research on orphan support programs in Uganda. At that time, she had George to work for her as a translator and research assistant, and together they explored the workings of an orphan support program operating in his home village. After they completed the project, George did his BA at Kampala International University and also worked as an assistant for several other historians and anthropologists. When China asked George to join her in working on this new project about her, she suggested that instead of working as an assistant on the project, he might work as a full collaborator and that they would try to co-author most of the writings. A startup grant from the University of Virginia allowed China to hire George to work on the project on a full-time basis. In February 2018, they received a grant from the National Science Foundation. This grant not only allowed George and China to continue with the work, but it also allowed them to hire me. George and I had grown up in the same village and had known each other since I was a young girl. It was thus to their mutual delight when they met me by chance while I was serving as a volunteer educator at the alcohol and drug unit at the National Psychiatric Hospital. By that time, I had already finished my BA in community psychology. I'm now completing my MA in um, medical anthropology at Gould University. Over the years, Georgia and I have conducted feedback on a full-time basis. During this time, China joined the team conducting fieldwork in Uganda for a total of 24 weeks, spread over the course of the four years, and participated remotely through extensive weekly meetings via Skype, where we reviewed the transcripts and notes. Over time, our team has also included our friend Noah O'Beary, who worked as our driver, our tech support specialist, and later our transcriptionist. We also worked with a number of University of Virginia and Ridge College undergraduates. Life in Uganda has inclined all three of us to convert material wealth into carefully composed networks of relationships wherever we can. As we as will be made clear throughout this talk, it is next to impossible to do anything in Uganda without relying on a dense network of relational ties. In our commitment to collaboration, we are bringing insights drawn from Uganda and elsewhere in Africa about the ethics of interdependence into the rapidly expanding conversation about the need for more collaborative forms of anthropolog anthropological practice, and in the process, helping to transform a long history of important but largely invisible contributions made by assistants and translators in Africanist anthropology. This process of working together across a wide range of sites has ultimately transformed the project into something that none of us could have created independently of one another. Before we can speak meaningfully about recovery, we also have to say a word about relationships in terms of the role that alcohol plays in contemporary Kampala where bars serve as the primary public site for social connection. And this is particularly true for men. For men, bars are spaces of pleasure, friendship, and possibility. They're places for mobilizing social projects and talking politics. They're crucial sites for connecting to job opportunities, a point we found to be equally true for brick makers and business lawyers. Like the tea fathers of Niger are described by Adeline Mascalier, these bars figure as spaces of belonging and experimentation which enable people to carve provisional spaces of existential possibility in the face of severely narrow teachers. Bars are experientially and pragmatically seen by drinkers as places of movement and flow. It is not only the pleasure of the flow that follows as beer and waraji flow from body to glass, sorry, bottle to glass to body, but also the pleasure of the flow of money itself in a world where a strict logic of economizing dominates most spheres of everyday life. There is also the flow of people, friends and strangers alike who found themselves there at the bar looking to get out of the house to breathe some different air for a while. Between these people, words, ideas and opportunities flow as people are released, if only for a few hours, from the pressures and tension of everyday life. Friendships formed in these bars are often trivialized as people are encouraged to avoid their former partners in crime or to change their people and places. There is an implicit assumption that little of worth will be lost in this transition, and that there will surely be other places where people could rebuild a different set of social connections. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to pick up and start all over again. 
In Uganda, finding a home, a job, or even someone trustworthy enough to repair your car fundamentally depends on being positioned within a dense net, dense web of trusting relationships. While relationships forged in bars, like all relationships, are not universally positive, they are indeed relationships and cannot be severed without costs. These relations and the forms of mobility they enable are put at risk when someone decides to stop drinking. With this in mind, in our talk today, we focus on two of the four therapeutic pathways to ask how and in what ways do inpatient rehabilitation and Pentecostalism address this situation? Do they allow for the continuation of old friendships on new terms, or do they demand a complete cessation of those relationships? Do they create opportunities for the creation of new ties, and if so, through what means? If we know that well being in Uganda and perhaps everywhere depends on connection, and that for men, the bar is the primary public space where that connection occurs, what happens when the life sustained in the bar becomes one un one's undoing? What happens when one must turn away from this singular space of sociality, movement, and trust? As we've mentioned earlier, several inpatient rehabilitation programs have emerged in Kampala over the past decade. These centers include a government-funded hard-day residential program at Mutaku Hospital offered to people with alcohol and drug addiction free of charge and a number of private clinics of varying levels of formality. These programs largely follow the Minnesota model, applying principles drawn from AA in an inpatient setting. Most of the patients at these uh, centers are male, speak English fluently, have attended university, and come from wage earning families with relatively high incomes. Some former patients from these centers continue to see each other at Kampala's 2 AA meeting, and some have gone on to form an NGO dedicated to supporting Ugandans living in recovery. One of the defining features of the programming at the rehab centers and AA meetings in Uganda is the, in, is the tension between efforts to teach people in recovery skills that will enable them to resist the relapse and the sense that the temptation towards relapse will always exist for them as a result of the ways in which their addictions are permanently altered their biology. Given that the leadership at both centers was trained and mentored by US-based addiction specialists, it is unsurprising that the programming at the centers involved in this study revolved around this model, this understanding of addiction as a chronic relapsing brain disease. Before moving forward, we wanna spend a moment revisiting the history of this model. While carrying forward aspects of a research program that took off in the middle of the 20th century, the CRBD model did not fully coalesce in the United States until the 1990s. In his seminal 1997 paper, Addiction is a Brain Disease and It Matters, Alan Leshner, who was at that time the director of NIDA, defined the CRBD model, arguing for the urgency of its, of its acceptance by policymakers and the general public, who he argued, um, had the idea that addiction, the idea that addiction is a chronic relapsing disease of, a, of the brain is a totally new concept. In this article, Leshner argued that two decades of neuroscientific and behavioral research had shown that prolonged drug use causes pervasive changes in brain function that persist long after the individual stops taking the drug, making the addicted brain, quote, distinctly different from the non-addicted brain. As opposed to earlier models, which Leshner saw as stigmatizing drug user, users or focusing on the need to help people through the acute withdrawal, the CRBD model sought to reframe addiction as a chronic illness that could be managed but rarely cured. Given the long lasting effects of drugs on the brain, metabolic activity, receptor availability, gene expression, and responsiveness to environmental cues, Leshner argued that successful drug treatment could result in a significant decrease in drug use and long periods of abstinence with only occasional relapses, but that a per permanent cessation of compulsive drug seeking was an unrealistic goal. Since this time, the CRBD model has become the guiding force of most NIDA funded addiction research in the United States, and has been the model at the center of many landmark articles and special issues. NIDA's call for broad public acceptance of the CRBD model in the United States has spread beyond the pages of scientific journals with talk of hijacked brains and fluorescent images of fMRI screens flashing across American televisions and informing the curricula on addiction in American classrooms. Patients and their families at rehabilitation centers in Uganda are now likewise instructed that addiction is a chronic disease and likely to diabetes, cancer, and HIV. They are constantly reminded by staff and volunteers that a recovered alcoholic is not a cured alcoholic. There is no cure. 
you are always an alcoholic, they say. At family Saturdays at the expansive Lake Uri recovery center, parents were told that alcohol had permanently changed their children's brains and that these changes could never be reversed. Clients in Lakeview classrooms were encouraged to get used to the disease, to remain consistent in their efforts to avoid relapse and to be constantly vigilant. An addict can never truly be relapsed, the counselor said. Closing a session for new patients at the government-run recovery unit, Sister Nantambi reminded them of the importance of the closing lines of the AA Serenity Prayer. Help me to accept the things that I cannot change. It is a journey, remember. Once an addict, you remain an addict, even when you are sober. At times, the mark that was put, being put upon these characters extended beyond their propensity to relapse. One remembered uh, one of the therapists they had met during their time in a rehab center, telling them that al alcoholics were liars. You addicts will do anything. You will lie, cheat, steal just for a drink. While people, and not only people recovering from addiction, do indeed lie, these words reverberate, reverberate in the social space of the recovery community, where accusations of lying can add to the difficulty of regaining trust, shaping many social interactions. While we do not aim to contest the neuroscience that informs the CRBD model, we do follow the lead of researchers who have explored the harms this model can inflict upon those who have been diagnosed harms that are now spreading beyond the United States as this model gains international acceptance. Having lived with the Sierra BB model as a family framework for understanding substance use disorders for many years now, many may find it hard to suspend the naturalness of the idea of addiction as an insurable disease. Likewise, you might take for granted the need to maintain good boundaries, not only with those in recovery, but really with anyone. And yet this is not the only framework for addiction or for relationships that exists. In our talk today and our larger book project, we argue that some of these other ways of thinking, ways of thinking which all place an emphasis on the possibility of transformation and release and on the importance of social connection and community, have the capacity to orient people towards time and social connection in very different ways. In what remains of our time together this afternoon, we return to consider narratives similar to the one that opened this talk, exploring the models of spiritual warfare and deliverance at the Orient understandings of addiction and Pentecostal fellowship in Kampala. Within these churches, people are taught to understand addiction as the result of actions of the most spiritual forces in their lives, and to understand that moving beyond problems with alcohol requires them to exercise the spirit, which is causing the problem through deliverance. We argue that despite the apparent severity of the spiritual warfare discourse, this way of understanding addiction leads the members of these churches to see people as fundamentally separable from the spirits that might cause them to be, and that this understanding combined with social forms which create opportunities for connection and for repeated demonstrations of trustworthiness create important opportunities for people to begin again. On a cold rainy morning in May 2018, Sarah went to the Pastor John's fellowship to pay a visit to one of the people we had come to know there. Pastor John established this fellowship at the Friday night cell meeting in 1992. Just prior to this in 1990, Pastor John had been living in London as a migrant worker. He says that while he was there, he received a calling from God to return to Uganda to start a fellowship ministry. Fellowship ministry. Over the next 10 years, the fellowship outgrew the garage where they had been meeting and several other spaces after that. Eventually, the fellowship grew so large that its members decided to construct the building where it presently stands in the rapidly developing suburbs just south of Kampala. It had been a few weeks since Sarah had last seen Richard, but she had heard someone say that he had been assigned to manage the parking lot. Sarah set off by Boda Boda, and by the time she reached Pastor John's, the rain had stopped and the sun was shining. Being a public holiday, the parking lot was already full despite the early hour. Over the tops of the car, Sarah could see Richard, tall and thin in his long green army jacket, army boots, pale blue trousers, and a faded black t-shirt inside of his jacket. As he caught sight of her, Richard smiled broadly. Praise God, who told you I was here in the parking? Fumbling with his large black registration book and pen, he tried to find a chair where Sarah could sit. She refused the seat, and instead he handed her the black counter book and blue pen he was using to register the cars. 
Sarah, today it's you registering. Thanks for coming, he said with a smile as he jogged off to give instructions to the other men he was working with. Left with the book and pen, Sarah tried to follow what she had seen him doing. A car came in and she noted down the license plate number, the owner's contact number, and gave the owner a card to be returned when coming to collect the car. Much to Sarah's relief, Richard soon returned and took back his book. Unlike Sarah, who was new on the job, Richard interacted freely and happily with all the people coming in to park their cars. Some were extremely friendly, and it was clear that they had become attached to him. Children came by and Richard played with them, giving one small boy some money to buy lunch. It was growing hot, and Richard persuaded Sarah to sit next to him in the shade. He gave her a mango. From time to time, cars came in and Richard jumped up to register them. Seems like a hard job being out here from morning till late, Sarah said. Yes, but I have to ser serve the Lord, said Richard. It's through service and humility that he helps me. You never know. Sometimes I even get what I never expected. I've made a lot of friends. Some tip me. Recently, I met a lady who worked at Macquarie University. University. She promised to get me the form so I could go back to school on a government sponsorship. We're now planning for the 2020 intake. Richard went on to explain that on Wednesdays, he leaves Pastor John's to go directly to another church on the other side of Kampala. He only sleeps for a few hours and then gets up early in the morning to join in their door-to-door -door preaching ministry. I believe God is training me for something big in ministry, for I teach the congregants and I pray with them. Then afterwards, I come back here and resume my work in the parking. As he talked, Sarah was sweating. It had become extremely hot and neither of them had had any water to drink. Their conversation was also punctuated by the cars coming in and out. One car broke down while it was coming in and Richard got up to push it. On that morning, the parking lot had been three years since the New Year's Eve night when Richard had heard the voice of God calling him to get saved as he was preparing to enter a bar to give a concert and had been living the, at the church for the better part of that time. As it's true for, other attempting to, for others attempting to move beyond alcohol by taking up residence at Pastor John's church, Richard has been given a series of small jobs with increasing levels of responsibility and visibility the job in the parking lot being the most recent. While this job checking license plate in a parking lot may not seem like a big deal, this point has given Richard a chance to interact with all the car owning people who come to Pastor John's church. These people have come to admire for Richard's positive attitude and the new system he developed for registering the plates and organizing cars. This small job has given Richard a way of proving his trustworthiness over a long period of time. It has also provided a means for him to increase his visibility too and relationships with others who might be able to offer a pathway towards other opportunities. And such connections seem to be a vital part in his recovery process. For Richard then, Pastor Jones was both the physical place where jobs and opportunities manifested themselves, as well as the source of his belief that God is training him for something big and that orients him towards his work and towards his future. Rather than feeling stuck in a difficult low status job, far from the central action of the church office, Richard sees his work in the parking lot as a step on a divinely given pathway that is leading him to bigger and better things. While Richard is perhaps naturally a friendly, hardworking man, he's He's having a hope that blessing would come to him through his work at the church, change the way he interacted with people and approached his work. This sense of possibility and hope likely made such blessing even more likely to come his way. In his book, Rich, uh, Red for Hope, the philosopher Jonathan Leyer writes about the process through which the pro, the pro chief plenty cooks found the ability to respond to a situation of near total cultural collapse with what Leah calls radical hope. Leah writes that what makes this hope radical is that it's directed toward a future of goodness that transcends the current ability to understand what the goodness is. In Leah's book, radical hope is what ultimately allowed plenty cooks to stretch the core, the core virtue of courage in a way that enabled him to face the reality of catastrophic loss and to lead his people through it. While standing at the ethical abyss of sobriety differs in important ways from the abyss of civilization collapse that plenty cooks face, stepping into any life with funda fundamentally, which fundamentally differs from the life one has been living requires tremendous hope and courage. While we want to avoid stretching Leah's concept of radical hope beyond its limits, the means through which both Kajumba and Richard acquired the hope necessary to reach out towards new forms of life was similar to the way Plenty Cooks acquired his ability to engage in the form of radical hope that Leah described. Plenty 
uh, like 20 cooks, their cooks were founded on experiences of divine guidance. These experiences um, assure them of their place in God's plan and the divine warrant for the difficult actions they would later undertake. Like there, we can be agnostic about the source of this experience while still acknowledging the crucial role that dreams, words, visions, and embodied experiences played in their ethical lives. At one level, we can think of this experience as giving them the psychological resources necessary to do what they did. Paul Robbins' discussion of Christian theologies of interruption takes us one step closer to the emic terms used by other Christians to think about these radical experiences of transformation. For Robbins and the theologians he draws upon, Christian interruptions both confront a person with an existential threat and a promise that one will be returned to an enhanced continuity of life. In addressing his earlier writings on the conversion of the Europe Min in Papua New Guinea, Robbins brings together theological writings on interruption with his earlier arguments about the threatening prospects of non-being that the Europe Min collectively face as the world around them began to shift through processes related to colonization and missionization. While the endangered ritual prestige that threatened the Europe Min is different from the threat proposed threat posed by the experiences of despair and isolation that confronted Richard and Kajumba, there is a similar sense of an existential threat serving as the ground upon which God's interruption works. The aim of this latter interruption, God's interruption, is not return, but newness, or rather a restoration to the being the person that God originally created that person to be. Further, as Robbins discusses in a later chapter in, on passivity in the same work, such an interruption is not the result of a person's own efforts, but is the effect of God's action in the world. As Robbins notes, this way of thinking about transformation is quite different from many other ways of thinking about transformation or about trauma as something that would require a slow and perhaps unending process of rebuilding. This concept is crucial to Robbins' project as he is committed to a form of anthropology that asks how our models of and for the world shape our experiences. In thinking about the concept of interruption in relation to the concept of trauma, Robbins is asking what difference it might make for people experiencing situations in which their very being seems to be at stake to have a theory of the situation, which gives them reason to hope that they will be restored to an enhanced continuity with the self they were meant to be. As is clear in Richard and Kajumba's stories, this hope extends well beyond the perceptions of the given individual. Richard's faith that God was preparing him for something big gave him the energy he needed to face the many long scorching afternoons in the parking lot, but it also gave his fellow church members a reason to hope in the possibility that he was fundamentally separable from the spiritual forces that had caused him to drink. And this also played a critical role in changing his life as these people now had the reason to believe in the possibility of his transformation. Likewise, a deep faith in the possibility of transformation allowed Kajumba's fellow churchgoers at the Christian Glory Center to open a space for him in their community. Like Richard, Kajumba also took up a series of small opportunities as they presented themselves, sitting in the same seat for Bible study and church service every Sunday for more than 20 years and voluntarily sweeping the drainage ditches that surround the church each morning. Over time, these proved to be the ground upon which he built trust and new relationships, both within the church and within his family. Despite the links between some forms of Protestantism and Alcoholic Anonymous, the forms of radical hope and Christian interruption that shaped the Jumba and Richard's experiences of recovery differ profoundly from the ideas found in the inpatient recovery centers and recovery communities. As they made their way to one of Kampala's newly founded AA groups, Richard Kajumba likely would have been told to see themselves as having a fundamental and unchanging condition. Like they would likely have learned to identify as addicts, to have learned that they were a particular kind of person. By contrast, Richard and Kajumba came to understand themselves as having been delivered from demonic spirits and born again, freed from the influence of forces that were never them anyway. They understood themselves to be responding to a call that came direct from God, from a God who sought not only to love and restore him. Considering the transformative potential of these spiritual experiences also requires an understanding of the ways in which lives are shaped by a community's belief in the possibility of transformation by their willingness to accept that things truly could be different. The collective faith that someone might truly be transformed opens up radically new possibilities for the incorporation of people into new communities of care and relationship. 
these new relationships are imperative given the importance of relationships in Uganda and the central role that bars play in their constitution and maintenance. The dense sociality of the church gave Richard opportunities to demonstrate to others just how true this was as he spent his days working in the path of law. By contrast, Kampala's addiction treatment centers all subscribe to the model of addiction as a chronic relapsing brain disease and deploy this model in ways that inadvertently fosters forms of suspicion and hopelessness, which can make trusting relations and forward movement difficult to achieve. While there are certainly tensions at these churches as well, we argue that hope in the possibility of profound and divine author transformation allows people to form different kinds of relationships in the present and to live with a sense of confidence about what may be coming in the future. What we hope to have made clear in this talk is that Richard and Kajumba's spiritual experiences and the ties of social connection that were made possible by a shared mode of atonement gave them both a profound sense of hope that a new life was possible and a safe and concrete space where that new life could take shape. Thank you all um, for listening. We look forward to, to answering questions. Wow, thanks, thanks so much. much. And I'm echoing. Can you hear me? Those of you on Zoom? Okay, good. <laughs> I, I want to thank you again for such a beautifully narrated talk and um, subtly analyzed. I, I'm really captivated by the ways that you um, show how people create their worlds and their worlds create them in a bi-directional way and the dreams, as you said, dreams and um, callings and beliefs really make a difference to people's realities, just really so nicely done. I have asked for anyone who has questions or comments to post them in the chat or to feel free to raise their hands to ask directly. But I'll, as people are gathering their thoughts, I'll kick us off. I have a lot of different questions. Maybe I'll just start with this one. Uh, it seems that today you, oh, and before I go any further, there's something I was supposed to announce in the very beginning that I didn't announce, which is that what you heard today comes directly from a forthcoming book by China Shirt, Sarah Nemrembe, and George Makanga called Higher Powers. It's the same title of this talk, Higher Powers, Alcohol and After in Uganda's Capital City. So I just want to put that on your radar so that it's coming out in February, February. 2024. So Tee up right now to place your order with UC Press. And it's coming out open access. So you don't even open have access. to place an order. Even you can better. just download the PDF. You even better. Okay. So be on standby for that. So having said that, I know that in the book, you cover many different treatment pathways. And today we heard a little bit more about the biomedical model in contrast with the um, Christian um, slash Pentecostal model. And I wondered if you wanted to add anything more about the traditional healing healer model or the herbalist model that sure. I know you also have studied in depth. What more have you been able to learn about the social forces or social technologies of recovery yeah. from those models? That's a great question. Um, so one, for anybody who's coming to the Society for Ant Psychological Anthropology meetings happening in San Diego later this weekend, there'll be a whole talk on the spirit mediums there. So we'll see a very different piece of this. So maybe if we can try to slice that question through the sort of question of social connection that, that comes up in this talk. Let's say that the, um, the kinds of social connections that occur within the space of the Sabo or the shrine where the Basamize gather look in many ways quite similar to what happens in the churches. It's also a space where people can come and spend long periods of time together in community sometimes in ritual, sometimes just hanging out playing Ludo. And that sense of having a place to be and a whole sort of new set of social connections is there as well, as is also the sense that um, this problem with drinking was never them anyway, it was the spirits. And so once those spirits can be successfully negotiated with and Damoyana is going to stop drinking through you like a straw, um, that the, all of those things you did were not quite you and that you can be someone else, and that there's a way to explain that. There's another model for what might come next and a community in which that takes place. Um, and also some really important forms of 
sort of not only belonging, but real prestige can happen as people um, enter the process of training to become um, leaders of new communities. The sort of space of the, um, of the herbal medicine treatments actually looks quite different from any of these. So within the sort of herbal emetic therapies where people use a variety of different plant-based compounds that produce some really intense vomiting, um, it's usually mixed in with alcohol and then given to the person either with or without their knowledge, makes them vomit uncontrollably. And if you've ever had food poisoning and you go back to try to eat that same food again and you're like, ugh, the thought is that it will produce the same kind of aversion response. So not unlike what was done in the Pavlovian treatments in Russia. Um, the thought there is that there isn't so much of a deeper cause to this drinking, but there's a kind of a sort of simple chemical technique that can be used to sort of alter a, a sort of sensory experience of alcohol. And the, the people that we've known who've gone through that treatment um, don't really seem to see themselves as sort of different kinds of people. It's not really an identity. Um, and also continue to go to bars and spend time in bars and spend time hanging out with their friends in bars and, and keep most of their um, prior social relationships intact, except that now they're not drinking all of their money. And so, you know, one man that we've written about extensively went on to be the treasurer of his motorcycle taxi association and sort of became a, a really sort of um, respected person within in his community through that means. So they all sort of have different paths, um, but the sense of, of a, a different kind of possibility and a different relationship to what sorts of social spaces might be open um, are certainly there across the board. Thank you. So that was very interesting. And uh, so are there like, Apparently, there are other avenues and methods on attaining uh, sobriety other than uh, collective ways, is what I'm hearing. You seem like you guys are reading off the desk, but uh, and I was trying to keep up. But it was quite interesting that I, that I get to get paid and hear about this because I'm first in a product of a drug uh, problem, right? And so, um, so it's really interesting that across the world, I know that addiction is, is you know, it's a thing, right, across the uh, globe. But to hear you come and share this story about uh, other avenues and methods of combating addiction is very interesting. So I was really pleased to hear your take on Uganda and how other regions of the world can forced together to combat uh, alcoholism. It was really great that you both were here, actually. So I kept thinking, yeah. like, I wonder, I bet these stories sound similar to something that- Yeah, so the universe obviously had us here for <laughs> <laughs> Right? I, I wonder if I could add on to that uh, astute comment and ask if either of you, both of you have done different kinds of work with US partners and folks on the US also. And since we're sitting in the US, I was wondering if you could comment on what we might learn from Ugandan pathways to recovery. What might be some of the take home points as we're looking at the highest overdose death rate any, any country in the world has ever experienced right now and clearly failed policies, failed approaches. What might we take away from your study of these different treatment pathways and social technology? All right. So um, we actually tried are trying to answer this question right now in a second study that I've been working on with Josh Burroway and Ab your own alumnus, Abigail Mack, um, and looking at very sort of similar paths um, in the rural United States and far southwest Virginia and northeast Tennessee. Um, and I think there's aspects, and again, we've, we've just now finished the ethnography for that and the analysis is, is beginning. I think that the sense that um, the kinds of, of material that we presented today actually look quite similar to what we see in some churches in that area in terms of, of spiritual warfare discourse and whatnot. That's more true in the Pentecostal non-denominational churches than it is within the kind of neo-reformed non-denominational churches, which are often look quite similar from the outside. And then you get into it and you're like, oh, you're actually thinking about this problem in a really different way. Um, and so having some level of, of nuance in terms of the different theological models that are being at play actually seems to be really important. So 
understanding sort of what is the sort of theory of atonement that's at, at play in this, what's the sort of theory of salvation that's in play in this, changes in some ways what different communities look like. But I would say that, you know, coming back to the importance of social connection there, though many of those structures also provide sort of really sort of dense spaces of social connectivity for people, but it's also really complicated and opioids and methamphetamine are also not alcohol. And I think that sort of trying to think through that, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging story and there's ways in which there's resonances and then other ways in which um, things, are, things are just are, are difficult and, and different. I also think that, um, and Sarah, I don't know what you would think about this. I feel like in Uganda, the ways that sort of an understanding of possession play out have a kind of level of detail to them because there is a long tradition of spirit mediumship. And so a sense of like, it's this spirit specifically and that that can be kind of recognized by an entire community um, seems maybe a little bit different. And also the residential quality of a lot of these church spaces. So Pastor John's, if you were to go into the sort of main meeting hall, you would find this enormous stack of plastic jerry cans, plastic water jugs and suitcases. And those belong to all of the people that are actually sleeping on the grounds of that church. And I don't get the sense in most American churches that that possibility of a residential, not enough an official, like here's your bed and here's whatever, but like that you can go and you can be there. Um, also, I think shapes things in a somewhat in a somewhat different way. Um, but I do think like we we in part chose these pieces of the project to give today because they are the pieces that are here in the United States. So we could tell you about spirit mediumship and what that looks like but we're probably not going to um, be able to revive a tradition of spirit mediumship in, in the United States in a way that would be meaningful to people. But these kinds of stories are ones that people in the US tell all the time too. I think maybe it's a matter of making them hearable, particularly within a medical context where such a story might be easily looked sort of out with skepticism or not even raised because it seems to be sort of out of place and having some sense of possibility that this might actually be the way that this person is thinking about what's happened to them. And that could be a really sort of deeply meaningful part of their lives that is not to necessarily be dismissed out of hand. Someone else has one? I think I'm just like Chile and say, um, we take form compared to the US and we find that um, in Uganda, we are, highly socially connected in that everything is done. Like we have this bill of governance, the social, um, uh, our social fabric is still very, very intact. Yeah, so now you find that we have to come through for each other. So in these spaces, you find that uh, in biomedicine, we are a bit distant. So even the Western, when someone comes in, you know they are like, you're, you're sick you're supposed to be that. And you find these other spaces, these people are embraced, they are loved, they are accepted and they are not judged. So that speeds up also recovery. They find hope in these spaces, they find love, and that there are different responsibilities and they are trusted. That's why uh, you find that, uh, why, well, actually when you look at um, uh, recovery, then you find that people who are recovering so well are in these spaces. So even the young people from biomedical uh, setting, they run to these other spaces. And you find that the people decide to stay in there because they are trusted, they are, you know, they are, there is hope, they are given hope all the time. And as soon as they are given where to sleep, they are not turned away. Of course, there is a, it's a charge, but people come and sleep there and uh, go uh, out and do other stuff during the day, they come. So that alone, actually pushes that with this bit of homelessness of, uh, you know, so they have a space where to stay in the church, even sometimes the pastor can give them food. Their community is like your brother, your sister. So everyone has to look up to the other, other than the other side where the people are pushed away. They're like, you're on your own. Even at home where, where we're sending them, the, we usually in family therapy, we usually tell them, you know, we used to tell them, you know, you don't have to trust them, you know, they are liars, they are lying. So now they go back and they are locked up and eventually they relapse because they are depressed and they have nothing to do. They can't go back to their communities where they had formed uh, relationships. So uh, you feel like in the, these other settings, 
like Habo and what, they, are, they go back to the other settings and they are okay because that's where they get their job, they get their connection, they get spouses, they get funding. Those are the people they know. And now if we cut them off from those relationships, they tend to delay in addiction and, you know, be kept up in that setting. I think too, if I can just add the, the the ban on sort of concrete material aid within AA groups, which is sort of part of, of that set of teachings that you're here to do this kind of support, yeah. but not that kind of support, is also particularly painful in Uganda, where what it is to be in a relationship with someone is to do practical things for each other, is to share money, to yeah. share resources, to give jobs, to do these kinds of things. So to say like, we're here to do this, but not that really falls in, yeah. in a way that feels cruel at times and in, in a way that I think maybe in the US context just feels different because friendships are, are different. So I know there, oh, there are at least two more questions and we're almost oh, out of time. Oh, oh, oh. So I wanted to quickly put on the table a question in the chat, which yes. is about women. Is oh, this yes. not different for women? And then uh, Ippy, would you like to give a question and then we'll let the speakers close out. I think he said in the chat that he's he might have popped off. Oh, oh okay. Well then, see you in San Diego. <laughs> okay, so if you had to leave, but now we can ask the question. Maybe we can end with women. I know it's a it's a big question. It's a big so question. Thumbnail sketch. Do you want to start, Sarah? <laughs> you want me to uh, um what is it? Is it about? Oh, how this looks different like differently for women. Both of your examples were men. Yes. Um, uh, women, uh, you know, uh, addiction is kind of gendered. I think it's common everywhere, but in Uganda, you're like, a woman who is drinking is seen as someone, else, you know, is labeled in so many things in the community because mm -hmm. that's our culture. So um, now it all happens also with recovery, where someone's seeking care. You find that women you find it hard seeking out care because of the stigma that comes with it. So now, uh, most of the times they die drinking, or if not, by any chance, they happen to come across such settings. That's where they seek help, they get help, uh, because that's where they are not judged, they are accepted. Now, when it comes to the biomedical setting, where you have uh, got a chance to work, you find that uh, in the hospital, you find majority of men. You find on like a two, uh, recently when I went there, I happened to find like six women, but those they are not the only women who drink in Uganda. Mm. There are so many people, <laughs> so so many women drinking and using other drugs, but there were only six when I attended that session recently. So you find that uh, even in the hospital, they are like, even their fellow users who are in the hospital, they are like, mm -hmm, that one, you know? So they kind of, those ones, they are stigmatized, so they can't easily come out, which is a really big challenge when it comes to recovery for women, for also seeking care for, for women. So I think that is the main thing, but women drink and women usually, are just like men, they go to bars, though those who go to bars are also labeled, but Uganda is a happening place and women, we go to bars, we frequent them and uh, for different reasons. Yeah, sometimes it's for money, sometimes it's for, you know, so many reasons to come up with why a woman should go to a bar, sometimes to get someone or something like that. <laughs> so um, that is it. That's how uh, it is in Uganda with uh, women, but yeah. they do drink, though it's gendered. So a new woman who's using is seen as someone who's, uh, uh, is level, kind of level. So I, I think to, to build on that, maybe um, it's not normative, normative for women to drink in the way that it is normative for men to drink and so sort of a question of the sociality of the bar like there's yeah. other places where women go and they spend time together at home and, and whatnot and so that um, I think presents some different opportunities there and I think what, what Sarah is saying exactly about the sort of question of stigma um, within the rehabilitation centers is sort of doubled for women not only are you a drinker and maybe a liar but then you're also you know this that and the other and so the chances that you're going to recommend that this woman that you met in rehab marry your brother? Like, no. But in, in a church space where the sense that this spirit was never you anyway, being able to break that off 
does open the possibility that, and you know, one of the women who's in, in the project we write about extensively in the book, you know, ended up getting connected to another member of the church and they've gotten married and she's gone on to have another kind of life. And so I think that that question of being able to break with the sense that this wasn't you um, is, is super extra important for women. I wish we had more time because I feel like we're just getting started, but this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. to stop the Zoom link because I want to make sure that the recording gets captured. Maybe I'll just maybe just leave it. Yeah. <laughs> Is it okay to end the meeting or? Thank you all for Yeah, you can end the meeting, but make sure the recording is captured. Thank you. Uh, that's, I'm going to make sure of that right now. Okay. Hey, Bernie. This was the first time we've done a long, a long version. First book so, talk. First book talk. Yeah, <laughs> so you already made some sales yeah. here. Especially <laughs> <laughs> the free download free version. Download. <laughs> did you have to pay extra? Yeah, we did, which is one of the reasons I agreed to become an yeah. associate yeah. agent. So yeah. I was like, you get money for it. Um, at, at UC Press yeah. uh, with Kate Marshall. Yeah. Yeah, it's been is fabulous. It in, yeah, is it in the public anthropology series? No, it's in the Windows Open Access series. Well, you guys take cupcakes. <laughs> That's interesting. You know what? I had three so of them. Well, they 